So uh, continuing very much the same sort of theme, um, we have another panel now uh, which is being uh, chaired by Rachel Solomons. Um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce her and then pass over to Rachel to, uh, to kick the panel off. Uh, Rachel is the first scientific advisor to the Space Command, uh, unsurprisingly because the Space Command has just appeared and, uh, and uh, Rachel was the first one to move in there. Previously DNS, uh, engineering support to many air platforms, both manned and unmanned. Um, and then she moved into the innovation realm uh, with uh, Stratcom and DASA. Um, for those of you who were on the last um, Defence Space um, Conference, which is the one that we did completely virtually, uh, you may recall the Space Pitch Day, a really successful Space Pitch Day, which um, uh, now Rachel actually um, led that, so, uh, and that was a real highlight of the last conference. Um, so joined uh, Spacecom last year, and um, I will now hand over to her able hands. Thank you so much. And Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm the science advisor at UK Space Command. So what that actually means is that it's my job to make sure that Space Command and wider defense space is getting the right access to science, technology, innovation, um, be that via our friends at DSTL or academia or industry. So when I was asked to chair this panel today, I thought perfect opportunity to get some very clever people in a room and essentially do my job for me uh, and answer some of those key questions around novel technology, but specifically how MOD can best put itself in a position where it's ready to exploit uh, emerging and disruptive technology. So a huge thank you to the panelists for joining me today. Um, I'll hand over for some introductions. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Gemma Atrell. Um, I'm working at DSTL in our space program as the lead scientist. Um, so one of the hats I wear is to take care of all our low TRL science um, across the whole scope of the space program. Um, so that involves a lot of external engagement with both industry and academic partners. Um, one of the roles of DSTL is really to undertake research in-house that absolutely has to be done within government. But the rest of the time, it's very much a partnership with a very much broader ecosystem. Um, one of the key roles that all of the staff undertake is the role of technical partnering. So something I thoroughly enjoy um, and work with some of the folks up on this panel. Um, my other hat is as um, Chief Scientist for Space Weather. So my academic background is in solar and ionospheric physics. And although I work as a scientist, I consistently find I have one foot in engineering, um, particularly when it comes to, comes to understanding the impacts of our environment on all of the different systems that we utilize. I'm passionate about STEM outreach. We've had some great presentations on that um, already this morning. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to basically playing a cohering, drawing together role, I think, as we go forwards um, into meet, being able to meet the challenges ahead of us. I'll say it to Emma. Thanks, Gemma. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emma Pantelli. I'm Head of Government Relations at Reaction Engines. Part of my role is um, engaging with government and looking at our public policy priorities. So unlike many of the esteemed panelists I'm with, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor of any sorts, but I am very passionate and engaged about innovation and science and technology for the future for the United Kingdom. Part of my background has been uh, working uh, at CERCO, where I was actually seconded into the Ministry of Defence, looking at um, the Defence Engineering Champion Team, working with the Defence Suppliers Forum on people and skills. So I'm also very passionate about the skills landscape, and I think that is actually one of the challenges with S&T today. Um, and I've also spent some time working in Cabinet Office and for parliamentarians as well. So I'm very much coming at this from that policy framework approach, what policies can help tackle the S&T challenges we see today. And there's the team. Hi, I'm Gary, Gary Lay. I'm one of the um, vice presidents at CGI. Um, I've worked on the industry side all my life for about 30 years, very much in the sort of aerospace and information technology sectors, a sort of variety of roles running large programs, half a billion pound programs, uh, running capture campaigns, uh, running p and centres. Um, but I really wanted to share my, my inspiration in, in space. When I came out of university, I joined a, um, the precursor to CGI, a company called Logica. 
and I was put on this program called Cassini Huygens. And uh, I was writing onboard software for a, a European probe that was going to Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. And what, what really excited me was that at that time, we didn't really understand Titan at all. The best photographs we had was just of this sort of orange haze. And during the development of that program, we had three theories that Titan could have been a, a global ocean of methane, it could have been a sort of frozen world, or it could have been like Earth with uh, rivers of methane and, and mountains. So I, I found it very inspiring to work on something that was so exploratory. It's the, it's the object that's gone furthest from the Earth and landed on another moon. And it was a great, great British success. Uh, the UK did uh, the entry, descent, and landing systems. Martin Baker made the parachutes. The software was written down in Leatherhead. And we went to Titan, and we did discover that the surface of Titan is rather like the Earth with mountains and rivers of methane. So that was my, uh, my inspiration. I was very pleased to see your reference uh, yesterday, Anuj. Uh, hi, my name's Sean Alvidge. I lead the Space Environment Research Group at the University of Birmingham. Um, so our group, Space Environment Group Serene, um, was set up as a collaboration between the university, uh, DSTL, and the Royal Academy of Engineering to, to try and specifically bridge that kind of interface between science and academia, industry, uh, and government. Um, now, whilst we have the sort of part of our research group, which is focused on you know, fundamental physics, um, we also do a, a large focus on, primary focus on upper atmospheric modeling. So the ionosphere and the thermosphere, uh, how that can be used to enable new technologies, uh, like uh, new uh, over the horizon radar, for example, uh, but also for comms and sensing in general, so for the ionosphere, um, and also in the thermosphere for space conjunction analysis and debris modeling and all those kind of things. And, uh, and the model that we, um, we've got a couple of different models, but the one of particular note is currently being made operational at the Met Office Space Weather Operations Center um, for the ionosphere and the thermosphere component. And then we also have a separate model that's currently uh, being made pre-operational for uh, ESA as well. So. <laughs> Our primary focus is, is trying to, to bridge that gap. And I'm, I'm conscious that I think of all the people that you've had speak to you, there are maybe uh, three of us as uh, academics. Um, so I can say whatever I want. Um, but uh, but I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a role there that, that academia can play, perhaps uh, that will come out during the conversation today. Hi, good afternoon all. Uh, Jeremy Poulter, Solutions Director in Defence and National Security. Uh, my role is to try and solve wicked, complex problems, leveraging all of Microsoft's technology, but doing it very much with our partner ecosystem, from the largest Defence Prime to the very smallest startup, and including those in the UK. Um, now, last time I was on this stage was at the Air Power Conference in 2017, and I remember there were several tweets saying, why the hell are Microsoft here, um, talking about digital transformation. I'd like to think that was quite prophetic because I think we saw in the integrated review a huge emphasis and shift towards data and digital. You can do a word count if you wish, look at the exponential curve over the last few defense and security reviews. And we feel that Microsoft has a huge part to play in that. So General Darrell Amerson yesterday talked about a software defined, hardware enabled digital force. I think those words are really quite profound, or they have profound implications for the way that we view solving some of these problems. And indeed, I'll give you one example. Just recently, we deployed our AI onto the space station to support a space glove. There's a YouTube video you can go and have a look at slow time. But that was about using hardware in that case to just host our software. And I think we may be shifting towards that with some of these assets in space will be carriers for things like the AI at the edge, and we've heard that a few times. And so I think there will be a shift towards more of a software-defined space, as Matt Broadhead described it. In fact, in the commercial sector, we're already seeing that. And it's for that reason that 80 months ago, we launched Azure Space. Um, and the idea there is to combine all of that technology, our terrestrial hyperscale cloud infrastructure with those space assets, particularly looking at how you exploit and analyze the data that comes off those platforms. So that's my particular interest. Now, there's the bad news or the sad news about Azure Space is we have no aspirations, unlike some other tech firms, to send people into space. So my long-held ambition to become an astronaut is likely to be unfulfilled in uh, Microsoft. 
But my particular interest in this group is I'm also co-chair of the Defence Digital Industrial Strategy alongside uh, Ministry of Defence colleagues. And I think there's some very similar tenets and themes that are coming through in terms of skills, in terms of acceleration of the pace of change and the realisation of that value. And I do wonder if some of the lessons and the things that we're exploring within that working group could also be redeployed into the uh, space industrial strategy whenever that might be produced in the future. Thank you. So a really diverse range of experience and, and background, so really grateful for that. Um, so what I'm going to do is look at the online questions and then open things out to the floor, so, so manage it in a bit of a mix. Um, but what I'm going to do first of all is start with what is potentially a, a very obvious question for this panel, but is, it is, are there any key technology or capability areas that should be at the forefront of MOD space investment and why? And I'll leave it up to you who starts with that. OK, <clears throat> if I kick off with that. Um, so I've already explained I come from a space environment background. Um, and actually, as I've taken on this lead scientist role, it's because I have that background that I actually stand a fighting chance of even having a conversation across all of the many, many, many different areas of expertise that make up space. Because ultimately, everything has to function in the environment. It's the single non-negotiable that we all have to deal with if we're working in this field. So it's step one of any military engagement is understand your playing field. You know, you need to do your recce, you need to understand what the lay of the land looks like. Um, so I think it really forms part of space domain awareness and this very much aligns with MOD's number one priority. So it is the number one priority for a very good reason. Um, from a military perspective, being able to attribute disruption in a timely, accurate manner is a real priority. Um, and potentially, the timescales on which we need to do that is where we may differentiate a little bit um, from some of maybe the commercial demands. So understanding what's going on and being able to figure out rapidly whether it's due to natural hazard or whether it's due to malicious threat is really key. Um, so I will put that out there initially. Um, and in terms of specific technologies, um, we've had a lot of discussion about commercial EO capabilities. Um, we've touched on some of the radar capabilities. Um, and another one that I just wanted to highlight in terms of um, potential pull through um, as we move forward is the area of hyperspectral imaging. Um, again, this is an area that I feel MOD needs to play a key role in. It's not necessarily driven by demands from the commercial sector, um, but I think it is a key capability as we move forward in our role. Um, yeah, I'm happy to go next. Uh, so I'm going to jump straight to the answer, but then provide a bit of context to it. So helpfully, Vlad yesterday, when he uh, very kindly dialed in from Ukraine, gave the answer for me, which is that need for assured access to space uh, with responsive horizontal launch. Now, just to take that back a step, I think there's conditions when we're looking at technology and what new technology we should, should invest in. Um, Vlad mentioned it yesterday, but looking at the geopolitical and geostrategic context we're in. So obviously we've spoken about Russia being a huge threat to our space space outer space space, uh, as well as China, um, and also, you know, Russia losing the access or stopping access to Suez has been a massive issue and it makes us rethink what we should be doing on launch. And then I also think we need to be looking at, um, I mean, linked to that is also the changing nature of warfare and how warfare is changing for the future and space as this domain for potential warfare and where defence needs to think about its role in that. And obviously responsive launch there has a place. And then also just looking at the unique capabilities that exist within the United Kingdom and where we can lean into the strengths of our industrial community, our academia community as well. So for example, for responsive launch, propulsion would obviously be very key, uh, as well as looking at... Um, dual use, which I've spoken about on the last panel, but also this re redefining uh, nature of resilience and security. I think in the past, resilience and security has been seen very much in that defence domain, but we're seeing it definitely broaden out to, you know, the protection of all of our citizens, which is what defence and security has always been about. But I think that has been a change in how people view that, particularly if we look at energy assurance, particularly if we look at debris management in space. 
Um, and then that, their responsive launch could also play a role as well because um, for energy assurance, for example, you could look at space-based solar power and having a responsive launch for debris management as well could also be helpful. So in terms of you know, technology that the MOD should look, at, look into investing in, and as Vlad helpfully said yesterday, I think responsive horizontal launch is an area that would be absolutely critical to the UK for the future. So, I'll go next. so um, I think I would argue quite strongly that we shouldn't lose sight of the value chain and the product in, in our investments in S&T. And when we look at the sort of value chain, we really have sort of sensor technology, kind of data network, data transformation, and ground processing. I mean, today, we have more data than we could ever imagine. When I sent the probe to Titan, mission success was one photograph from the surface of the, the Titan, the moon. Today, we have uh, optical data, infrared data, RF data, um, radar data. We have huge amount of data. The problem we need to solve is how do we get that data back down to Earth, and how do we turn it into action actionable intelligence at the speed of relevance? So for me, we have a big data problem. I, I know General Armisen's slide had information advantage at the very center of that. So we, we need to work on the big data problem. You know, we need to find ways of fusing various data sets together. We need to find ways of automating the analysis of the data so we can free up our own um, human analysis, analysis to do a higher order tasks. And we all need to do this very, very quickly. So we have, I think, throughout the conference spoken about AI. We absolutely do need to continue to progress AI in the context of space. Perhaps we need to do that in a sort of very narrow way to start with, where we're training systems to perform specific tasks. But I think AI is a big part of the solution. Just coming back to the sort of data transfer networks, we need to increase the capacity to get all this data to ground. I think looking at optical is very, is very good. We need to consider data relays. And we need to recognize that the network topology of the future be far more complex. We're potentially blending together Leo mega constellations with, with Mio and Geo. And we need to look at the way we operate those constellations, the routing of the traffic. And indeed, we might find that AI has a role there in detecting patterns for us to uh, be more efficient in the way that we manage the, the communications back down to Earth. OK, I'm going to say something different. and. Good. Controversial. Um, so, I mean, on, on the one hand, I mean, like Gemma said, obviously I work in the space environment group, so the answer is space environment. Um, but, I mean, the analogy that of yesterday of like, de you know, deploying a naval asset somewhere uh, is a good one because it would be like deploying a naval asset somewhere without checking if a hurricane's coming tomorrow, which would be fairly foolish. So, forecasting of the space environment is obviously important. But if, without taking a maybe a literal uh, maybe if I'll morph the pretext of the question a bit, but the, I think the unique capability the UK has that should be exploited is people in terms of academics. The whole host of um, government people yesterday have you know, held their hands up and said they move into a role that they're perhaps not experts in, they become experts, which is great. Um, and the words I heard all the time yesterday was about government talking about working with industry, 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 which is wonderful. But there's also this massive network of academic expertise, which has the benefit of not trying to sell something to the government. I mean, no offense to everyone, but I can't imagine the solution maybe that CGI would propose would be Microsoft's latest, greatest, and vice versa. There's, a, there's something beneficial from sort of the unbiased um, academic view that I think could be presented. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, I have a really good working relationship with DSTL, um, but I'm not sure if that's commonly repeated. And I think that's highlighted by the number of academics here. Um, and I think there's perhaps Perhaps there's some ideas and preconceptions of what academics are like, and sometimes that is very, very accurate. Um, but, but not everything is like that, and I think perhaps there is, there is work to be done, not just on education. Education is obviously very important, and there was a lot of discussion about education yesterday, but I mean actually on strategic decisions and how you work out what is to do next and what is the latest, greatest things. That research is probably being done by academics around the country and I think there's a capability there to to bring the communities together which should be more fully exploited. 
keep mine short, um, space component of the digital backbone. It's the glue that holds all of this together. Um, the exploitation path, other comments that have come through, I think getting that right will be critical to realizing the value, taking that information to the decision maker. And I think particularly when you think consider space, it's not just the home base, not just UK, it's deployed assets, it's overseas territories, it's the true global footprint. So being able to really get that right, and I think there's an opportunity to do so, I think will be critical to seeing that capability land over the next five years. Thank you. Some really important points, and I think it's always really useful to get that academic view as well, so, so thank you. Um, going out to the audience now, does anyone have a question? Yeah, one at the front here. Hi there, sorry, me again. Uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace. Um, does, it, thinking back to our new president's um, comments about think big, space is big, um, does defence really understand uh, the implications of rapidly dropping launch costs? Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Starship's projected costs of $10 per kilogram to orbit and probably reaction engines as well, as, as, there as well. I mean, um, what, what does this actually mean if it comes to pass in terms of, you know, 100 tonnes to LEO ultra cheap? Are, are we thinking big enough? Uh, I'm happy to take that one mm. in terms of launch. Um, Firstly, caveat, I've been at Reaction Engines for three months, so <laughs> give a gal a break. Um, but it's, it's actually a really important question because I think you look at all these things that are happening in terms of launch um, in different countries, um, and when you think about a reusable space launch capability, uh, lot, they're done in lots of different ways. If we're looking at the one that's happening in Cornwall later this year, that's obviously a commercial plane with a rocket launching off it, and that's kind of different to the proposal that Free Action Engines has, which is removing any sort of oxidizers off a rocket, which um, takes away the mass, um, which is about 40% of a conventional uh, vertical launch. Um, and then if you take away that, you can add on more uh, commercial capabilities, such as you know wings and more of a cargo. Um, and I mean, to answer your question, I think it's a conversation that needs to happen. And I think I was really happy to hear Kaz say yesterday that they are exploring, you know, what does responsive reusable launch look like? Um, and I think that conversation just needs to continue. And I would kind of urge the Ministry of Defence, you know, in terms of uh, if you're thinking about take, uh, exploring with uh, Virgin Galactic, I mean, also talk to your UK industry counterparts because it's something that we're also looking at as well. Does that answer your question? Was that a bit of a, yeah, <laughs> Tim's happy. Tim's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, um, sorry, Jim. Sorry, okay. I was just going to add the MUD perspective here. I think um, I think I can firmly say that MUD is well aware, sorry, I can't actually really see, um, <laughs> is absolutely well aware um, of the proliferated, you know, congestion, contested, competed environment that we have, particularly in low Earth orbit already. It's not, you know, Yes, we look ahead. Yes, things will get worse. But it's already a big issue. So I think, you know, thinking back to some of the work that our space operations folks do, um, it's already very much on the, up there on the um, operations daily, daily list. Um, so I think it's something that we're aware of. I would also highlight that MUD's interests are not just in low Earth orbit. Um, you know, we obviously do utilize information from other orbits as well. Um, when we do our forward look and our forward planning, we're absolutely not constrained to LEO. Um, yes, there are opportunities there, and I think LEO is often seen as um, a de-risking activity. You can demonstrate sort of um, fidelity and capability in space. Um, but there is a very much broader picture there. Um, but it, it certainly presents an absolutely huge challenge for everybody. I think not absolutely not just restricted to defence. This is very much one of those sort of dual mm. um, sort of military areas. It, it impacts everybody globally. Yeah. Um, I mean, the financial dynamics are compelling. I mean, I was very fortunate to work on the Galileo programme. And just to give you some illustration, a Galileo satellite costs about 40 million euros. That's in the public domain. And we launched two satellites on a Soyuz, so that's 80 million euros worth of satellite. The launch itself was a similar cost. That's a, a national security launch. 
but the saving you get in deploying the satellite through reduced launch costs is very significant. Um, I guess whether, I'm sure the MOD understands that. Um, the question about what the upside is, I guess, is a question you know, for the people who budget and for the accountants. I, I don't know what would be in the models, but uh, the dynamic is very clear for the industry. It's really enabling far more satellites to be launched and us to make more beneficial use of space in general. I have nothing useful to add. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. Um, so I'm going to build a little bit on the first question, I think, um, and look at it a little bit from the UK perspective. So is the UK leading the way in any particular area of novel technology um, development? And I'll start on this side, if that's OK. I would say the one thing that stands out for me is the strength of our digital economy and particularly the strength of some of our latent artificial intelligence skills. Uh, we are really privileged to be you know, blessed with, I think, the, the talent and attract the talent into this country to drive artificial intelligence adoption. I'm not sure we fully realise that opportunity as yet. There are many countries that would be hugely envious of our ability to do that. So I think the challenge really for this group is to see how best to incorporate that AI capability into the data analysis path in space capability. And we are certainly seeing green shoots of that both here and in our close neighbors. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think as maybe Gemma could mention as well, I mean, I think we do have unique space environment capability. I mean, even without trying to be the, the bias on, I think if we look at our colleagues um, across most of the other nations, I think they would probably agree with us. Um, we, we have got a really strong capability in space environment uh, modeling and forecasting. And, and that can enable, as I said earlier, new technologies. I mean, if you want to do something really interesting with uh, over the horizon radar, for example, then the precursor to that is having a good environmental specification. And I think that is truly quite unique. And, and I think also, you know, PNT came up a lot yesterday. I think across the UK, the, the quantum sensors people as kind of a quantum solution to PNT as a GNSS redundancy is, is world leading and, and fantastic. Um, but I guess that's probably fairly well known to most people as it seems to come up a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd add, I think there's two areas I would highlight. Um, I guess the first one's communication satellites. So Airbus in the UK have real deep experience in building communication satellites, a lot of expertise in payloads down at Portsmouth, and they've built you know, numerous satellites for companies all over the world. Uh, Surrey Satellites is actually building a communication relight satellite around the moon. So in that space segment area, we have some real uniqueness. I guess the second part of my answer would really be around um, the satellite ap application catapult. We have downstream skills in, in commercializing technology, in, in data management. I think those two areas are, are very strong. So I would actually agree with a lot of the panelists around PNT data comms, but I think coming back to one of the conversations you've had earlier in the day about how smaller companies are more innovative and they have all this great innovation, mm. um, I think part of the issue that the UK has, that perhaps uh, America, for example, doesn't is, you know, us humble Brits aren't necessarily very good at shouting about ourselves and getting our name out there. Um, so I actually think there's probably a lot of technology that exists within the UK that we are very good at and no one else can do, but we don't necessarily know about it. And I think there's some work to be done. And it's, you know, very great to hear that uh, Bayes and MOD are doing some work to look at, you know, the capabilities that are out there. What do we actually have across the country from small to big companies um, to, to look into that landscape to see what we do have? Because I think that you'd look from all across the country and I think you would find we have some very, very unique capabilities that no one else has, but we need to get out there, find it, and shout about it a bit more. Yeah, I would agree with the discussion that the panel's already had. Um, what I will add is completely non-technical. Um, and I'll just make the observation that I think one of the really special things about the UK is its size. Um, you know, we have a single conference here, and we have key players from right across the space enterprise. You can't do that in some other nations. It's just not possible. Um, I think with our size, it's, you know, we're not too small as well. You know, we do have expertise across the board. We do also have a really strong history. Yes, you know, we just have UK Space Command, obviously, has just stood up. 
Um, but we have a really significant heritage. You know, we've spoken about um, SSTL's contribution. We have established defence primes. And then if we go back to the academic heritage, again, was spoken about, you know, we have been doing defence and um, space in this country for a very, very long time. Also been doing defence for a very, very long time. Um, so the point is here that, you know, we're a small enough community to have a really relevant, agile conversation. And this was actually something that was flagged up um, to me by one of my US colleagues. Um, what we're seeing in the UK is the ability to get the right people around the table, make decisions, and pull through novel, low TRL, be it modelling, you know, advances in terms of, you know, you, maybe a novel approach to something as much as a product, but we are able to actually collaborate really effectively because we're just at this really interesting size. And I think that's something that is of significant value to our partners. And as the observation was made earlier as well um, by uh, the National Security Chief Scientific Advisor, um, it's something I've experienced personally as well in terms of sort of funding availability. Sometimes if you don't have the money available, you have to figure out another way to do it. And what that does in the UK is that drives a very innovative approach. It makes you collaborate. And those are things that, you know, we just have different approaches to our international partners. But I think with those different approaches comes a huge level of complementarity, really. May, may have made up a new word. But in, ter in terms of, you know, we are bringing something new to the table. We do have an interesting approach. And I think it's quite unique. I actually do think that's something that is valued by our partners. Um, and I think it, it helps us move forward altogether as a larger group. Yeah, really important point. Um, so 10 minutes left. I think no government-led um, panel would be complete without a question about the value of death um, and exploitation of those novel technologies. So um, what are the main blockers, in your view, to government exploitation of novel technologies? Um, who would like to come in on that? Jeremy? Sorry, start with that. A topic extremely close to my heart over the last 10 years or so. I think there's three things that we really need to work on collectively. The first one is the adoption of commercial technology, open standards. Uh, we cannot afford, literally cannot afford, to get ourselves locked into bespoke proprietary software, uh, hardware. And a lot of it is being virtualized, it's moving to software. So adoption of commercial technology and really being pointed about asking the question, why does it have to be different, is, is going to reduce the cost and I think help also to accelerate the exploitation path. The second factor, I think, is bold leadership and leading with curiosity and detail. What I mean by that, I think, particularly in space, I think you do have to get a bit more into the detail, absorb and immerse yourself in the technology to really be, to have the confidence to work with your specialists and make those bold decisions. And I would credit the likes of Goddard and Harv and, and Jules and the interaction I've had with them because they are people that are curious. I've seen it first time and I think we're lucky to have that leadership here in the UK. Um, so please continue to do that. Be curious so that you can be bold and transformative in your decisions. And finally, I think if we, when we run the documentary on Space Command in five or ten years' time, how did it happen, where do we get to? And if Netflix are, or if I can say that company, um, aren't already on it, then they should be considering it soon. Um, I wonder whether commercial will be the unsung heroes. So inspired commercial function supported by legal and finance. Um, I don't know how many commercial officers are here in the room, but I do feel that being novel in the approaches without necessarily adopting those frameworks could be key, key to success. So open standards, bold leadership, and a really inspired commercial function. Thank you. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, I, I, well, if, I, if I take the exploit to be exploiting, I'm going to take the, that academic knowledge again. I think... The, the only thing that can be done is taking advantage of what Gemma said, that the country is pretty small, uh, and then and taking in mind what Emma said, that people aren't great at selling themselves. And I think certain leadership are going to have to get in the car and go to universities and see what we do, because a lot of academics are pretty bad at shouting about uh, what it is. 
Uh, and frankly, a lot of them probably have no idea how it could be exploitable. The idea of writing impact for research funding is actually a thing that terrifies academics because they, they don't always want to think like that, which is fine. But you, someone needs to do it. And the only way I think you're going to get that knowledge is to make some trips out to these universities, um, have some coffee and, and see what we do. Um, it's not a huge investment of time, but I think the, the benefits could be could be huge, but, but someone's got to go out there and actually do it and put some hard work. Drinking coffee is not that hard, but um, you know what I mean. Okay. Um, I, I find this a very interesting and difficult question because I think there's an inference that there shouldn't be a value of death, that everything should progress from S&T to R&D to development. And I'm, I'm not sure that's right. There may be things that, that are not suitable for the military's use there may be technologies we've pioneered that we that are ahead of their time, that they, they might be put on the shelf for four or five years or ten years and be taken up a later date. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that everything should pass through the valley of death. I think there would be good reason for some, some things to be stopped and some things to be paused. But for those that do need to go through, I think what I would say is the sooner we know the MOD's intentions, the better. And I know... I'm sort of seeking clarity where clarity is not there, but industry will naturally uh, position, invest, sort of seek, uh, seek out SMEs with the, with the technology of intellectual property if they feel there's an operational program coming. So I think as always, as always is the case, the more information, the more knowledge, the more um, Anton of your strategic intent we have, the better we can, we can serve you and help you. I agree with everyone, which means I don't have much to add. I think the leadership point is such a great one. Um, I think your point there is um, spot on. Uh, and I, uh, Alex's point earlier when he did his presentation actually about you know acting fast and failing fast, I think is also really important. And great words to hear. I don't necessarily think we're there as a country yet. I think that we are quite risk averse. We are a bit worried about failing. But there are great pockets of things happening within defence. DSTL is a good example. The Rapid Capabilities Office is a good example. And I think we always need to take that and um, take that in, into a defence space environment so that we can you know, act with pace um, at the speed of relevance, which keeps coming up. Um, so I think we've got lots of opportunities. I mean, it is, I mean, um, and you asked a brilliant question earlier about ARIA, um, which is such a great question, something I was actually going to ask him, so that, that worked out quite well. Um, I mean, that, that would be a really good opportunity, if even if it's not necessarily looking at space, because the great thing about, um, you know, science and technology generally is there's lots of opportunities. There might be something that's happening over here that you wouldn't necessarily think is relevant to space, but then it turns out it is relevant to space. Um, and it's a shame that ARIA has kind of, taken a bit longer than it should have done to get started and to get going. And somebody made the great point earlier about it's also about innovating around processes. And I think that's another area that um, would help within this. I won't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, what I can add is that I think it's about making sure, go back to that, you know, we, we're one team here and we need to have that entire team engaged from the very beginning. So this is spanning, you know, you're technology readiness levels, usability, application levels. It's about you know, having that engagement at the lower levels and making sure it's sustained right through to delivery. Um, just as an example, within our new DSTL space programme, um, we're setting up research exploitation working groups, which effectively means that we have our end users engaged even in the lower TRL research area. So the idea here is that you're having a sensible conversation from the beginning and that you have end user buy-in from the beginning. And I think then when you do come to cross that valley of death, assuming it is something that has earned the stripes to be able to pass through it, I think you sort of automatically have um, you know, a pull-through mechanism established there. At least the community that's actually heard of something you're doing before is always helpful. Um, I'll conclude with one more comment, which is you know, money is incredibly important. And you know, the outcome of the integrated review has obviously enabled a lot of what we are seeing today. That obviously needs to continue, and that investment, particularly in our skills base, to sustain the future, make sure we can continue doing fantastic work. That's really, really important. But it's not just about money. Um, as we saw yesterday on the stage, the personal relationships between our leadership across the different nations is absolutely fundamental to making things work. Um, and I think that's reflected right the way down 
um, even at technical working levels as well. I think it's about establishing good relationships and realising that as a nation, as international partners, we all need to be pulling in the same direction. And so I think that's something that sort of sits separately from finance. And we go back to that more sort of exist, existential th you know, threat and the requirement that we don't have an option here. If we're going to achieve anything, it will only be achieved if we all work together. So I'll just leave it at that. Perfect. Can I just Thank add one, yeah, on. just one point to that? Because for some reason, I've decided to take on an extremely pro academia badge. But um, <laughs> the, the, what came up yesterday, and I think just come up here now is that you know, when industry and SMEs are interested in knowing sort of where modern government want to fund in the future because they can pivot towards it and there's this idea if you could you know tell all your state secrets then fine they could target it um, which I totally understand the thing that's great about academia is essentially we're like sort of curious cave people that just make tools because they might be interesting and sometimes they're not um, and sometimes they're totally useless but we make them for fun um, which means that actually, if you, if you want some really novel next generation stuff or the generation after next, then maybe that's where it is because we're not necessarily looking for how to, uh, the business model of that, we're just playing around in a lab. Uh, and I think that is a, a unique capability that just came to me, so I thought but, I'd mention it. Can I just add, I mean, I, I understand the point, but there is a place for pure research. I mean, fractal mathematics, this was in a cupboard for 50 years before there was a use found for it. So I think these things have value. That <laughs> Absolutely. It's whether, whether the time is right to, to move them forward. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's definitely true. I mean, we have lots of tools that... I mean, most cutting-edge... Maybe I could annoy all of the applied people, but most of the cutting-edge applied stuff that's going on is at least 100-year-old pure maths. Yeah. So, um, um, <laughs> so really, everybody is at least 100 years behind. But, yeah, um, yeah OK. <laughs> Everyone's really applied here, I guess. I have a wrong audience. <laughs> that feels like a good time to conclude this, <laughs> I think. Um, and I don't want to keep anyone from their coffee breaks. So um, I'll say thank you to the panellists and, and thank you to anyone who added a question on here. Um, once again, really kind of fantastic to get that diverse range of views and really helps inform my job when I work with, with industry and academia and, and DSTL, so thank you very much. <laughs>